so much for your company. I am Pius Kujo Baka. Let's now look at our stories and rating agency Fitch has emphasized that the official creditor committee, including the Pari Club and their government, will agree on the debt treatment parameters by the end of 2023. However, it expects the government to conclude an agreement with the private creditors on comparable terms by the middle of 2024. Here's more in this Business Desk report. In its comprehensive analysis of frontier markets, Fitch said the agreements with the two external creditors will pave the way for Ghana to move out of its default position. Zambia recently reached a deal with its external creditors, allowing for the restructuring of its external debt. The UK-based rating agency said Zambia's debt deal gives hope that frontier markets' sovereign restructurings could be resolved more quickly going forward. The International Monetary Fund estimates the financing from external debt restructuring must amount to $10.5 billion between 2023 and 2026. Ghana was able to obtain approval from the International Monetary Fund Executive Board for a $3 billion economic credit facility arrangement on May 17 last year, following the establishment of the Official Creditor Committee for External Debt Treatment. To re-establish debt sustainability, the IMF is requesting a debt reduction of about 30% of Ghana's public sector external debt at the end of 2022. And commercial banks fear the proposed euro bond bond uh, haircut could impact badly on the operations. Finance Minister Ken Furiata has announced that up to 40% cut on euro bond principal and about 5% on coupons. Now, this follows a domestic debt exchange program which has hit the banks badly, resulting in some heavy losses for last year. John Iwa is chief executive of the Ghana Association of Banks and has been speaking to Joy Business. Talking about the, the, the worst, you know, we are not very, very worst. I'm just of course, we I saw mean, in 2000. We've, 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 what we are looking for, I think the market is very hungry for some closure. Yeah. And we, we need some level of closure where we know that a line has been drawn. There is no um, debt operations in the horizon. We all know that you know, the, uh, uh, the, we, are, we are not done with the debt operations. Mm -hmm. Per se, the euro bond is outstanding, the bilateral loans are also um, are pending. We are hoping that, as the minister said, by the end of this year, who we'll has a semblance of closure to all these, then we will know that you know the very worst case scenario is over. You should know that the banks have investment yes, in euro yes, bonds as well. Yes, so, whatever and, decision and, and, and you are, you are that, spoken about the euro bond, the finance minister has done a proposal of initial up to 40 percent. Some will say that we thought the worst was over. Again, what could be the impact of this proposal on the banks? Or just like what the governor said, he believes that you have factored all these unforeseen expectations in, in your operations and therefore the shocks wouldn't be like what we saw in 2000. So what could be the impact of this proposal on your operations? Of, of course, I mean, the haircut in the region that the minister um, put out in that interview is, is deep. And um, as the governor said, I am also sure that the banks may have taken a significant portion of their own assessment of what the potential haircut was going to be into their as to whether the, in the bank's assessment that haircut that they have taken is closer anywhere closer to what the minister proposed is a question I cannot answer at the moment. But some will say that if they go or settle on that 40 percent, the impact could be grave. Some I think you said between 30 and 40, yeah, but that and is, the, and it, the, is, it is, I'm sure it is, it the is, shops is absorbers have been built. I'm sure it is the government ask at the table at yeah, the moment, yeah. and as negotiations go on to become clearer mm -hmm. where, you know, whatever haircut they agree is going to be, mm -hmm. and I, I cannot um, focus on that. But you, you think that the, the impact it would not be that grave or you think that you want to negotiate for a better position to lessen the impact on your operation? You know, the, the, the euro bond is an international uh, issuance mm. and it's guided strictly by the prospectors that support that issuance. Mm. In that prospect, it tells you in, in situations such as this, how negotiations are done. So at present, we are not directly at the table because the size of our investment does not kind of put us on the, yeah, on the table. So we are monitoring very closely mm. um, how the negotiations with the offshore uh, tickets, you know, go and we'll see how that impacts our operations. But I mean, per this current offer, would the impact be bad on your operations? 
Of course, I mean, 30 to 40 percent on principal is, 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 is very steep, except to say that the size of the investment is not to the level that we had in the domestic debt exchange. So therefore, the, we could minimize the expected shocks on, on, your, on your patients, even though... The, the, the well, any shock is a shock, you know, when you are planning and you are not in control of the plan because there are other variables that you are not, you are not controlling. Of course, whatever comes may depart from what your expectations are, you know, are and to the extent that whatever comes perhaps may be higher than what you expected, it can be a shock. John Ewa, in that interaction with my colleague George, we are fit there. Now let's move away from that and go upstream because government has begun talks with U.S. oil major ExxonMobil to return to the country. According to the Minister of Energy, Dr. Matthew Pukuprempe, moves have already been initiated for the comeback of the oil giant. ExxonMobil in 2021, you recall, abandoned its exploration exercise in Ghana at a time when major oil companies appear to be moving away from exploration of hydrocarbons. Speaking at the official launch of the ninth edition of the annual local content conference and exhibition by the Petroleum Commission, Dr. Matthew Pukuprempe said the U.S. exploratory firm is poised to operate in Ghana. They started changing their name from oil and gas to energy, energy. Uh, <laughs> but then they may started making fantastic record profits within that same year. Now all of them are backed up. All of them. They are actively getting new rounds everywhere in Africa and everywhere in the world. ExxonMobil intends coming back to Ghana. Interesting. They've already started talking. ExxonMobil. Because God didn't put the oil and gas there for us not to utilize. If it means that we have to develop our talent and skills and knowledge and develop the technology so that we can do more carbon extraction, let us get on with it. Let us get on with it. But it also tells us that we must train and train and train the Ghanaians and Africans in general to participate in your God-given natural resources. We shall visit the story later, but let's do the story. President of the Association of Ghana Startups, Solomon Eji, is optimistic. Fifteen challenges that hamper the growth of startups could be addressed with a startup innovation bill. He says the bill is expected to be sent to Parliament soon to be passed into an act which will provide the right incentives for those um, with a startup ecosystem or within the eco start uh, startup business. Now, Solomon Eji was speaking on challenges of startups at the launch of the Osei Business Park in Tema, correspondent Kwame Yanka has more. The business park is a co-working space for businesses which are on a mission to make social impact, the first of its kind within Tema and its environs. Although the idea to have such a space was birthed about two years ago, the building has been under construction for some years. Brains behind the facility, Mrs. Gladys Murphy, Nelson Amon and other partners believe working environment plays a crucial role in business growth. Speaking at the launch of Ose Business Park, President of Association of Ghana Startups, Solomon Eje, shares the need for burgeoning and established businesses to operate in such spaces. One of the major issues we've seen or we have now in the, in the, in the whole chain is infrastructure, um, especially for work and all those things. And there's a, a very wide gap in where people will sit and work. I mean, young guys getting to rent office for five years, six years, two years, paying that huge rent, it's always a challenge. And so that gap is there. And so based on that, we're happy that places like this has been launched today that will close that gap of infrastructure or, or office and spaces for the, the, the young people that we support as startup entrepreneurs. Um, so, I mean, for those around Tema and Clay area here, at least for now, we'll have a place to connect them to come and sit and work, where you can come in and, and pay for hourly or weekly or monthly or quarterly based on your own strength. One of the partners behind the facility, Chief Executive Officer of InnoHub, Nelson Amo, says, the co-working space will help take care of challenge of accommodation for startups and mature businesses. And the vision behind Ose Business Park comes from a question, where do early stage, growth stage businesses go to for support? Um, the next question is how do we address the issue of real estate deficit for small and green businesses? If I want to find an office space and I can't commit for two years and what have you, how do I get that kind of support? 
but beyond the space, if I want that support system such as coaching, mentoring, access to networks, access to partnerships, access to finance and what have you, where do I go? This is the kind of one-stop facility that offers all of these support. Another critical component in our business pack is the fact that we are anchoring fashion ventures. We have a fashion venture accelerator. The fashion venture accelerator in this space offers that platform where fashion startups would be given the needed support and opportunity really to scale up their, their ventures beyond what they've been doing. Nesinamo touches on possible conversion of idle structures and real estate into business parks. Most of these startups end up having to work from home, having to work from places that are not very conducive, or having to put all their working capital into rent. We need to be able to holistically address this as a country. We need to have more of such business parks coming up across the country, um, and particularly beyond the cities where you typically have a lot of solutions. How do you move into the small space? And there's so, and a lot of ideal real estate. Some of these corporate bodies, huge buildings, and they have a good part of it being idle. How do we begin to convert some of these into such facilities like business parks? Meanwhile, for founder of Osei Business Park and Osei Business Academy, Gladys Murphy, the facility apart from providing conducive atmosphere for work, it is also going to provide a place to polish up fashion designers. The bigger goal here is to be able to export dresses made. It's no good sewing only in Ghana and only Ghanaians, we can use it, we cannot sell it abroad and white people will come and wear it here but when they reach England, they throw it away. You don't see them in the street with Ghanaians outfit but we see them here. But I go to London all the time, I never met any white woman wearing our clothes and that I want to change it if I can. Um, to make it in a way that um, our Ghanaian materials, our Ghanaian kente, you know, our fashion is beautiful. Ghanaian cloth, kente especially, is beautiful. But if you cut it in a way that the white woman will wear it, they'll pay a lot of money for it. Osea Business Park is encouraging startups to use such avenues to build their network. So let's go back to our earlier story where I told you about the fact that government is in talks with um, exploratory firm, um, which of course happens to be a U.S. Uh, major oil uh, company. ExxonMobil basically returned to Ghana. Let's get in touch with um, an energy strategist, Dr. Yusuf Suleimano, who is also the chief executive of Eureka Energy for more on that. Thanks so much, sir, for joining me on Business Life. Uh, I would like to know your initial comments on news that talks have begun between government and ExxonMobil for a comeback. All right, so we shall connect. Open there um, for me. I want to go on. Dr. Yusuf Sulebana, if you are on, I would like to know your initial comments about news uh, of the fact that um, ExxonMobil is likely to come back to Ghana. Uh, Pius and good evening to the viewers. Thank you for having me. Yeah, indeed, that seems to be a refreshing news, uh, especially after... Uh, Ghana has been in this inertia for quite a long time, where we have three fields, and then we are struggling to cross even 150,000 of oil per, barrels per stream day. Uh, you know, so the, the fact that ExxonMobil is thinking about coming back to Ghana, as we are told, if it's credible, then that should be a welcoming news. That, that would then mean that um, we, stand, we stand a greater chance of increasing our production portfolio. And I can tell you, Pius, this is a time that every upstream producer is should be struggling. I mean, should be striving to bring up as many barrels as possible to uh, you know to the surface to be able to sell to uh, you know the public or to increase their production portfolio. Why well, I'm saying that because oil prices are in record high. It's in 90s. It's in late 80s, and it's only the best time to have investment being there. Now going forward, um, whatever whatever was happening or whatever culminated into their exit, I want to believe that uh, some of those problems might have been solved and. My, the information I'm gathering was the fact that the tax regime at the earlier stages were not favorable. And I can tell you, uh, um, 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 Pius, if you look at the at this stage of, uh, you know, if you look at the stages that that goes into oil production within the upstream before the production says within the EMP stage, let, let's say exploration and production stage, we have something we call appraisal and development. All those are m m money sinking 
you know, portfolios. Mm. You don't produce anything, but you sink a lot of money. So if at that stage you are putting so many taxes on players, it is just normal that they will not find a friend. So if the government told wise to soften the stand, especially at this stage, to get them back to, to continue where they left off, I think it's just a, a positive news. And we only keep our, finger, our fingers crossed to see how it pans out. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's something positive. Indeed, yeah. something positive, you rightly said. Um, we've got to optimize on this. And of course, um, what impact do you think this would have on the upstream sector? Yeah, come again. I, I am asking about... Oh, sorry, the, I didn't get that. All right, so I'm asking about the impact their presence would have on the upstream petroleum sector and if we are in the position to take advantage of that as well. Yeah, so the, the, the impact will be phenomenal. Um, ExxonMobil, they are not a mean player. Yeah, they are one of uh, what we call the seven sisters. Um, though uh, Ghana Fields seems to be a, a, a bit of a smaller portion. So some of us with the fact that, I mean, uh, they may find it's not fit. But however, if the government, however, uh, negotiation that they can do to get them back to get into the business, then that would be the best. Um, they, 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 they have credible record in the business, especially the field that they are going to. That deep water terrain is not an easy field. It requires a lot of technique. It requires a lot of capital input, uh, you know, to be able to get something substantial. So I think ExxonMobil, they are, they, they, if they, they finally agree to come and then to continue from where they left off, it will add into our, our, our absent portfolio. And I just mentioned that with the nation. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Yusuf Suleimana, for your time here on Business Live, sharing your perspective with us on the back of news that um, ExxonMobil is currently in talks with government for a comeback. You're still watching Business Live with me, Pios Kojo Baka. We've got more stories for you after this break. And it's day two of the Joy Business Summit, and we are continuing with our discussion on how organizations can engage their target customers in new ways of, uh, with digital technology. And digital technology has become a deep-rooted in the customer experience space. Here to talk about the evolving technology and its impact on cons consumer experience is Head of Digital and Inclusive Banking at Cal Bank, Martha Akwe, for more. Martha, thanks so much for joining us once again here on the program. Um, how well would you say technology has shaped, um, you know, our experience in the last decade? Um, it's made a lot of difference. But first of all, let me thank you again for inviting me a second time here on the summit. Um, I would say technology has had a lot of um, impact and positive one on customer experience. Um, yesterday, we had the chance of discussing um, quite a number of technologies that have um, shaped um, um, or impacted positively on customer experience. And just to recap, and of course, to mm. look at the impact now and later on, um, we did mention technologies like omnichannel technology, where customers are expecting that multiple channels will be used to um, improve their service experience. Um, when we say multiple channels, we are looking at email, we are looking at online, of course, phones, and then other options available. And um, most organizations in our businesses are actually using um, omnichannel approach to um, serve their customers. And you can see that going forward is still going to play a key role in doing so. Um, I see um, customers being more sophisticated and expecting that they are not only using the multiple channels, but also the channels are syncing mm. to provide um, seamless experience. When I say syncing, what it means is that if a customer in banking is mm. transacting on, let's say, an online banking platform, and for any reason there's a, a, a hitch, the customer should be thrown off onto another channel that's available in life to allow the customer to transact. So um, this has had a good impact so far on customer experience and service, and I believe strongly is going to make a lot of difference going forward as well. Mm. There's also a um, chatbot bot discussion we held yesterday, and I see more sophistication in that regard as well going forward. And um, we discussed how it has made it possible to offer long service hours to um, customers or consumers, and it's not going to change going forward. It's going to take the same approach. But I see face-to-face -face video engagements actually taking prominence mm. as we progress. Um, customers are going to expect that 
not only are we going to chat with them on phone or email, but also some sort of um, um, facial interaction. All right, so would you say as a country, um, we've had or been better in positioning ourselves to you know, leverage within the transactional space in, say, the business or the banking industry or the services sector? I would say we are well positioned mm. um, from what I see so far. Um, when I look at um, digital payments in Ghana, um, we've really made progress. There's been a lot of digital transformation in the last decade in Ghana. I mean, when you look at even financial inclusion in, in the country, it has grown significantly. And this has actually been because of um, collaboration between banks, telcos, and then also um, fintech um, um, organizations. They've all worked together, and you would see that when it comes to um, financial inclusion and mobile wallet adoption, it is very high in the country. I mean, inclusion has grown from the usual 50s and now is moving into the 60s and upwards. And some research is even pegging it at 90, but that can mm -hmm. be debated on. So, um, but I see that mobile wallet um, adoption has been very good in the last years, and um, going forward is going to get better. So, as a country, we are well positioned. Well, when I look at the banking sector, definitely we've all moved from the regular traditional um, brick and mortar to clicks. Now it's all about digital payments and digital banking, where various services are all being done online, on mobile phones, without the customer going to the banking hall. I mean, people are buying now based on e-commerce without necessarily entering a shop. Mm. They sit at home, order, and then it is delivered. All these things are things that are happening right here in, in Ghana, and to show that um, We've, we've advanced a lot. There's also been government-led interoperability between mm -hmm. um, payment platforms, fintech platforms, bank platforms, and the telcos as well. This has created very seamless um, um, services and convenience for customers, where a customer is able to transact between bank accounts and then a mobile money wallet. Mm -hmm. And um, that kind of service has also improved significantly transactional banking and um, transaction volumes. The volumes have increased because of this interoperability. Now, there are also um, regulatory support that has helped us as a country to be well positioned. You would notice that um, the central bank has taken a lot of interest in digital payments and technology, where it has actually set up a fintech office. And their specialty is just to drive innovation and then, um, of course, um, regulate innovation in the country. Uh, would you agree with me that indeed we've made some great strides when it comes to you know digitalization but the, it appears there is some gap we need to catch up with when you compare that to the developed countries uh, how do we do that how do we close up from you know, that that that's, in, uh, interesting one of course we are but um, from where i sit mm -hmm. um, probably from the banking digital banking space it's not so wide but there is, in, in, in being able to determine the gap or measure it, some metrics have to be put in place. I would talk about internet penetration being one, access to advanced technology being two, and then of course financial literacy. All these put together will be able to help to determine how far or close we are to developed countries. And for me, when you look at um, internet penetration in the country, it's not poor at all. Um, because of smartphones and um, penetration being high, this has been good. And so it creates the avenue for us to compete. So the, the gap might look wide, but not too wide. Advanced technology is the challenge where the developed countries have more technology than we do. But remember that we now live in a global village. So as long as the technology is available, a, a developing country can have access to it if you can afford it. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, I did mention how proper budgeting should be a provision for technology advancement in an organization. And it comes back to the same story, that advanced technology is available. If you can't afford it, you can always adopt it. And with most technologies these days being cloud, you don't need to be at the location of where the technology was developed to enjoy that. So that also makes it um, possible to close the gap easily. And financial literacy is key in trying to go or get to the developed countries their level. So as a country, we need to make, it that, uh, make that a key function that we'll be um, looking at. Thank you very much, Martha, for your time here on the program. It is Joy Business Summit. Of course, we shall be bringing you more in the coming days. Certainly, tomorrow is another day for the Joy Business Summit. And that's it for Business Life for today. I am Pius Kojo Baka. Thanks so much for your company.